morning, every day, everybody. How are you all doing? Good, I'm glad. We're here today to talk about the Wellness Think Tank by, based upon academic life and emergency medicine. This is an organization that we created, and we want to talk to you about how and why we got to where we are today about a year after the idea was originally concepted. The issue of burnout, wellness, resiliency, is an important issue in medical training. And it's an issue that many who are outside of medicine don't necessarily know a lot about. So that's what we want to talk to you about today. What are the issues? Why are these words, burnout, wellness, resiliency, associated with medical training today? What were the issues and what were the solutions that we came up with? We also want to make this interactive. And throughout this, we will have times for questions. And we definitely want you to feel free to ask us any questions you may have as well. We hope to make this a back and forth dialogue as much as possible. Ultimately, we want to shed light into the problem, give a glimpse into those who don't know about medical training, what it's like to be a graduate medical learner, and come up with better solutions perhaps than what we have even come up with. First, I want to introduce the panel that I have with me, starting with Arlene. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Arlene Chung. I am a practicing emergency physician in New York City, and I am also one of the assistant residency program directors for the Mount Sinai Emergency Medicine Residency Program. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shahina Braganza. I am an emergency physician from Gold Coast Health in Australia, uh, and I've also recently finished up a role uh, which is the director of clinical training looking after our pre-vocational doctors. My name is Nicole Bataglioli. I'm a practicing emergency medicine physician at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And again, I am Nikita Joshi. I work here at Stanford University. I'm one of the emergency medicine doctors involved with resident education, but also medical student education. Throughout this talk, we want to share our own stories of burnout so that it can perhaps give insight as to why we are actually personally vested in this issue as well. And my story, I also was trained in New York City at a county hospital in Brooklyn, and my training was four years. It was a pretty grueling experience from day one. It started off kind of already on the go. And of course, my fellow residents understood what I was going through, but that really is a very small subset of people compared to my, everyone else that I knew. And that included my husband, my parents. They didn't quite understand what I was going through. And I realized that I had a problem when I would come home and try to explain the situation, whatever I experienced that day with my husband, who's not in the medical field. I tried to explain to him the emotional roller coaster I went through that day based upon the patients I had seen, the workload, what it was like to work with consultants, perhaps difficult encounters, and more than anything, I just actually wanted him to just listen and not say anything back. I never got that. I always got words of advice, none of which I wanted, and it became actually so frustrating to the point where I stopped talking to him and we hit a point in our relationship where it actually uh, challenged our relationship. And there was a good point where I saw that perhaps this may not be able to move forward. Because my experience was so difficult, I felt so unable to talk to him about it. And, and of course, we moved on, persevered. I graduated. We're married. We have a child. And things are better now. But it's this issue of loneliness having no one to really talk to. That's just a small subset of the whole issue of what leads to burnout and what we hope to explore here today. So I'm going to turn it over to Arlene right now. What if I told you that there was a disease out there that only affected smart, capable, compassionate, and motivated people? What if I told you that this disease was almost always fatal uh, killing almost 100% of the people who it touched, and that the symptoms were completely unrecognizable to most people. If I told you that, and the CDC knew about that, they would be on top of that in, in a heartbeat. But there is a disease like that, or maybe not a disease in the true sense, but certainly an illness out there, and it's physician suicide. And one of the things that we hope to do today is to shed light on this issue. I, um, so I, I moved to New York City in 2000 and 
2014, um, shortly after residency. And I had had a passing interest in, in wellness while I was in residency, and I was part of the wellness committee there. And to be honest, it was mostly just organizing social events and resident gatherings, which was which was fine, which was great. And Personally, I, you know, yes, I thought residency was hard, but I got through it and I survived and I said, okay, I am leaving and I am going to New York City uh, to live my attending life. And within the first couple months of arriving there, this article came out in the New York Times, which was the first sort of realization for me that this type of problem existed. And one of the things that it did for me in reading it is that I came to realize that there is a problem in medicine, and it's a problem that we're really, I think, ashamed of, and we don't really want other people to know about, but there are these things that keep happening, and they're going to keep happening unless we address the problem. As the author writes, there is a strange machismo that pervades medicine. Doctors, especially fledgling doctors like me, feel pressure to project intellectual, emotional, and physical prowess beyond what we truly possess. As soon as that MD is appended to our name in May, our self-expectations skyrocket as if the conferral of the degree were an enchantment of infallibility. The internal pressure to excel is tremendous. After all, we are real doctors now. But there's a, there is a spectrum. It doesn't just start with a happy college graduate and then all of a sudden become a physician who's on the brink of committing suicide. Um, there is stress, certainly, which leads to burnout, which leads to depression, which then leads to suicide. This graph is just demonstrating data, but I mean, there have been there have been several studies that have been published since looking exactly what are the prevalence rates of depression and suicidality in our medical trainees, and it's enormous. If you're not aware that this is a problem, if you look, it gets up as high as over 30 percent. And can you imagine if? That 30% went on and no one recognized that there was an issue and they went on to become physicians and one in three physicians was suffering inside without, without being able to tell anyone and with having this sort of shame that they were struggling with this alone. And in fact, it's true. If you look at studies that are beyond even medical trainees, this is a study that was done in a population of US physicians across the spectrum of career, so from early career to late career, across all different specialties. And if you look, on average, the average burnout rate for all physicians is almost 50%. Uh, emergency medicine has the dubious honor of being number one at the top of this graph. If you see that little gray line that is shooting way above everyone else, that's emergency medicine, which is the specialty that I practice in. So clearly, this is an issue that's important to me as well. And so I, you know, I, I got really involved in wellness, right? I, I personally, you know, I had my struggles in residency. I wouldn't say that I ever suffered from burnout, but I really felt compassion almost more for my fellow physicians than I did for the patients, which, you know, it's our job as doctors to take care of the patients and we will take care of patients. But the question that I had is we are, you know, we're so dedicated to patient care, but who's dedicated to our care? Well, we have to be dedicated to our own care. And so I became involved um, in wellness organizations and in promoting physician wellness. And, and the culture that I was exposed to the first few years in New York following that first summer of 2014 was, was really encouraging. I was like, we're making strides, we're making progress, we're doing it. And, and then this happened. And then August 17th happened. Um, one of our deans, David Mahler, had written this perspectives piece in the New England Journal and he, I think he described it well why this keeps happening, why doctors are committing suicide. It's because a, there is a culture of performance and achievement that for most of our students begins in, medical, in middle school and relentlessly intensifies for the remainder of their adult lives. From their very first shadowing experience to their foray into the lab, from high school AP classes to GPAs and the MCAT, with helicopter parents, violins, varsity soccer, medical school rankings, licensing exams, and the residency match, we never let up on them, and it's killing them. So why do doctors commit suicide? We commit suicide because there is intense pressure to succeed. There's intense pressure to excel from a very young age. There is a very tiny margin for failure, and there's so much shame and stigma surrounding it. But what we hope to do is to pull back the curtains and to show you exactly what goes on inside and hopefully to shed light on this and to create a solution together. 
And that's why we think that this presentation is also so pertinent to have at this conference, where it's not just about medicine, but about the entire community coming together and looking at how we are training, pulling back the curtain, as Arlene says. So I want to take a moment if anybody has any other thoughts besides what Arlene has mentioned about the, the topic of why doctors commit suicide and any insight you may have as to why that happens. Hi, so I'm actually a first year medical student at Mount Sinai, so um, nice to meet you and <laughs> I'm sure we'll talk after this. Um, so just regarding this topic, I actually studied positive psychology at Penn. Um, last year I got my master's in it before coming to med school. And so I did a lot of research into this topic. I've heard everything from, you know, medic I don't wanna reach out for mental health resources because then, you know, I'll have to check that box on my licensing exams as I continue to get licensed. Um, like you said, the stigma, fear of, you know, thinking that you're compromised and unable to treat patients. And I think it's also a lack of emphasis on this in our medical education, as I'm sure you're addressing. Um, like we are so focused on taking care of patients, as you said, no one's helping us take care of ourselves and our, our institutions need to support it. It can't just be up to the individual. So um, we're making you know, a lot of changes and I look forward to the rest of the talk, but um, this is so important, so thank you. I think it's also important, again, to have it at conferences like this so that we can get input not just from the doctors dealing with this supposed doctor problem, but also from the patients and the industry themselves because everybody really is impacted from having a physician who may not be mentally stable and who may be suffering from suicide. So I work on the educational side of things, and I'm just curious how um, you would recommend or what you would recommend in terms of implementing resident wellness and resiliency into a residency program. I know that you know for us there's only so much time we can allocate to it. So um, we have ice cream rounds where there's uh, a session for residents to discuss what's happening. I don't think we do it as often as we should, like once every kind of term, four or five months. But uh, I was curious what your institutions do there. I think that's what the rest of this presentation will be about, um, our solution that we had come up with, the wellness think tank, that um, Nicole will expand upon once we get there. But over, overall wise, the answer is pulling together national resources and realizing that institutions have solutions, but nationally, if we can pull it together, I think we can come up with something great. So I'll take this to move on to Shahina. She's going to talk about this issue from an international and also an organizational perspective. Thank you, Nikki. My journey into wellness began about 15 years ago, when as a second year resident, I experienced a version of burnout. Uh, in brief, it was my boss who rescued me at the time, most impactfully with the words, I've been there. At that time in Australia, the attitude of the medical profession towards wellness was that it was at best an afterthought, and at worst, an issue that might have been considered an indulgence undertaken by those in the profession who were clearly not busy enough doing the legitimate work of being a clinician. And I suspect that you might be able to relate to that as well. Beyond Blue is an organization in Australia that researches and supports people with depression and anxiety. And in 2012, they conducted a survey that, in my opinion, really heralded change and progress for us in Australia. It was a national survey of the medical pro profession, uh, and their respondents numbered approximately 11,000 doctors and 1,800 medical students. Of its most profound findings, uh, this is one figure. So the figure on the screen here shows a comparative analysis of rates of psychological distress. In the leftmost uh, graph is the rate for doctors. In the middle is the general Australian population. 
and on the far right are other professionals, which includes other health professionals. As you can see, the rates of psychological distress in doctors is double that of the general population and about 10 times that of other professionals. There are very similar comparative data for all the components of burnout, and there's even more, comparative, more startling comparative data for rates of suicidal ideation. All of this has played out for us in the last two years where we have had clusters of suicide um, in physicians and in trainees. And this has really um, drawn the attention of our community and our media. And the medical profession, I feel, is now in a position where it must act in a way that is substantial and that is meaningful. In its closing statements, the Beyond Blue um, executive summary stated that doctors must resolve their stigmatizing attitudes towards mental health because their failure to do so not only affects their mental health, but it affects their ability to care for their patients. And it not only affects their mental health, but it also affects the community's attitude towards mental health and perpetuates the stigma that comes with it. Um, and so these are some of the things that we have done in response. The Australian Medical Association has made wellness a top five priority for the next five years. And as such, two examples of how it has acted are that it has enhanced its doctor's health advisory service in order to make it more accessible uh, and more relevant to what the medical profession needs. Another big issue that it's working on is that it's lobbying to change our mandatory reporting laws. In all states except for one in Australia currently, if you are a doctor and you seek uh, medical attention, for a mental health issue, the treating doctor is mandated to report you to our regulating body because your mental health condition might impair your ability to look after patients. And so that compromise of your registration and your ability to work is an obvious barrier to seeking help. Our own Australasian College for Emergency Medicine middle of last year conducted a very large workforce sustainability survey. And its findings very much parallel those of Beyond Blue. Predictably, and, our, and as Arlene has demonstrated as well, burnout rates are high in emergency physicians and in trainees. And a significant number of respondents reported intending to leave the profession within the next 10 years. The college is now working on a strategy and implementation in order to address this. Around Australia, several hospitals have taken the initiative to form their own programs. One that I particularly admire is run by a health service called Monash Health, on the bottom right of the screen there. And their program runs by the slogan, No Junior Doctor Will Struggle in Silence. Monash Care is an initiative that's completely initiated by hospital executive and designed to support junior doctors. And examples of some of its arms uh, that they've got a dedicated well-being officer, they have uh, mentorship groups, and they even have a perinatal group that supports young doctors, male and female, around the time of early parenthood. Where I work at Gold Coast Health, in our emergency department, we are working to embed uh, a wellness program in our ED that is focused around mindfulness. I would love to tell you more about this at our learning lab later this afternoon at 5 o'clock, we even have chocolate biscuits. Um, we are trying to take the approach of being proactive rather than reactive. And I strongly feel that we need to change our frame from s helping those who are struggling to a culture of positive growth, whereby we just create environments where everyone can be nurtured and everyone can thrive, whether they're struggling or not. Or not. Here's a little bit of what I've learned in the last few years of supporting junior doctors. Firstly, they are not simply us 10 or 20 years ago. Millennials are uniquely different in their characteristics. They tend to engage in groupthink and operate almost with a collective consciousness. And as such, I think a model that's based around peer support is most likely to be acceptable to them uh, and um, accessible. Secondly, they are completely wired to the internet. 
whatever it is they need input for, whether it's how to conduct a procedure or how to manage migraine, or even whether it's how do I manage my psychological distress, their go-to is the internet. And that's why I think um, an organization like Alium and what it's built around the think tank, which you'll hear about in a moment, is perfectly positioned to support junior doctors and residents. And my final observation is that whatever we build together in order to support our junior doctors must meet the needs of the end user. In my experience, junior doctors tend not to follow traditional avenues of help, such as human resources, or what we have in Australia and is called the Employee Assistance Service, unless we direct them to go there because they've made an error or because a specific issue has arisen. And so junior doctors must really robustly uh, inform whatever it is that we build from here. Having said that, and here's my call to action, it is incumbent upon senior clinicians to initiate, influence and sustain the discourse and action in this sphere. Larry Chu, in his opening address this morning, described our role as being the shepherd who guides the patient through the most vulnerable period of their lives. Our other vital role is that we are also the shepherd who guides our residents through the most vulnerable periods of their life, not just professionally, but personally. I feel that um, we are the people in the position of power and influence, and we are also the people who lack the risk that our junior doctors have. If a junior doctor were to voice a concern, they risk their career opportunities, and we don't carry that risk. It's also important to understand for us, I think, that we kind of created this in the first place, or we're certainly perpetuating it. Firstly, we aren't necessarily well in the first place. Um, we don't really look after ourselves in terms of wellness. Beyond Blue found that rates of burnout, psychological distress, and suicidal ideation decreased as we advanced in age and in seniority. But I feel that that's less that because we develop intrinsic wellness and more because we just develop better control over our environment. As a senior doctor, if there's a particularly unpleasant task to be conducted, we can defer it, we can even delegate it. The other thing is that our colleagues become more tolerant of what might be our dysfunctional behaviors as time goes by, attributing them to our own idiosyncrasies. Oh yeah, we all know Bob, you know, he's a bit aggressive, abrupt, unapproachable, but that's just Bob, he's a great proceduralist. And this attitude not only disregards the effect that Bob has on his colleagues, particularly his junior colleagues, but it completely dismisses the fact that Bob might have some significant struggles himself. We tend to wear our unwellness like a badge of honor, that if you're doing the job properly, you're going to be overworked, overstressed, and fatigued, and we don't model the prioritization of our own wellness to our juniors. And as such, we are then responsible for the culture not just within our profession, but within our specialties. We are now in a position, having inherited that culture from those who preceded us, we're now in a position to make a conscious decision of whether we allow it to perpetuate, or whether, via leadership, we just change the immediate environment around that, simply by inviting and encouraging the conversation on wellness, perhaps simply by saying the words, I've been there. And so my closing statements in this international chapter of the wellness story are that this is not an issue that's confined to one part of the world or to one specialty. It's a global issue. And if it were infectious, it could be called a pandemic. There are various groups working on this around the world. I think it's vital that we connect with each other because by doing so, we not only support each other, but we lend credibility to each other and together we might convert an issue that might be considered an indulgence into one that is not only legitimate, but one that is absolutely critical. So with that, we wanted to talk about what we actually did. So um, I am one of the board members of Academic Life and Emergency Medicine, which is a blog that was started in 2009 by Michelle Lin, who is an emergency medicine physician at UCSF. 
This blog started out as a repository of clinical pearls that she would develop on her shift that she would then publish as blog posts as a means of storing it. And it has quickly grown since 2009 to really be an academic hub for emergency medicine trainees and also turned into a community. And so academic life turned from a blog into a community. Over the years, we have tackled many issues, mainly within medical education, how to best share procedural tips, how to best learn the latest breaking in uh, the best ways to practice and treat pneumonia, for example. Uh, one of the things we then started to tackle was training. And a few years ago, we decided to gather chief residents nationwide into a think tank of its own called the Chief Resident Incubator. And from that, we actually began to find a few stars that were rising. Nicole is one of those future leaders in emergency medicine. And for Nicole, wellness was an important issue. And so we took that academic life. Our passion, as you can see, is to lead as a respected institution in advancing education, professional development, and community building globally using digital technologies, initially the blog, and from there, Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud, in emergency medicine and other health professions. Our niche is innovation, education, and community building in health profession education. So from this, working with Nicole and a few other experts, we developed the Wellness Think Tank. The Wellness Think Tank, our mission is to create a diverse community of residents and educators who collaborate, innovate, and advocate for physician wellness from the ground up. This grassroots initiative tackles resident issues such as preventing suicide and burnout, enhancing resilience, and promoting overall quality of life. Our ultimate goal is to catalyze innovative and positive change at the individual, institutional, local, national, and international levels. So before we get into really the nitty gritty about the program, which is what Nicole will be going through, I just wanted to take a moment um, to think about what we're really doing is taking digital technologies and the internet and taking that and tackling this really important topic of burnout and suicide. And so one thing I want you to think about as we move forward for the sake of time is is the online space really the most safe place to have this type of really deeply personal conversation that most people have individually, would feel very reluctant to share with their friends, their supervisors, and now we're asking them to share this internationally using the online world, which can be discoverable really by anyone and at any time, regardless of your privacy settings. So as Nicole describes what we've come up with and the safety measures that we put in, just keep that thought in mind. So as Nikki mentioned, wellness is a really important topic for me. Uh, as a third year uh, resident and a chief resident, I quickly during the middle portion of my third year hit a burnout point. I was the definition of burnout. I was depressed and there were definitely days where I rather would have driven my car off the side of the road than to show up to work that day. That was a pretty terrible place to be and as I moved through the rest of my residency and into my first year of practice on my own, this group kind of came together with other individuals who were also concerned about wellness and we decided to again, form this group using the model that the chief resident incubator had used pretty successfully to try to do the same thing to tackle wellness. To start, our leadership board included, again, folks who were very well versed in using these virtual digital communities, in addition to Arlene and myself, who really kind of handled the more day-to-day -day and project development. In addition to us, there are five other faculty mentors and five resident mentors uh, that are located all across the country. So we've got very good representation across the US and also faculty mentors and resident members from Canada. To start, you know, we tried to figure out who we wanted our stakeholder to be, and we really wanted to focus on emergency medicine residents. We wanted to kind of get in at the ground level of education where a lot of people tend to build and develop the techniques that they're going to use throughout their career to develop and maintain their own wellness. So we really wanted to kind of pick a stakeholder group that was a little more grassroots feeling um, and at the start of their medical careers. 
We offered this program free for every emergency medicine residency in the US and Canada. And programs were allowed to submit one to two residents that they felt were interested in wellness to serve as a, an ambassador or a wellness champion from their program. As you can tell by the map, we've got some fairly good representation across the US and then again, folks from Canada. The platform that we use to communicate is Slack. For those of you not um, very versed in what Slack is, it's a cloud-based online collaboration and um, communication tool that's used by a lot of companies. To address what Nikki brought up about safety and is the internet you know, a safe place to kind of conduct this sort of business, um, Slack is pretty useful in a sense that it allows folks to communicate directly via direct messaging. We can also communicate via locked channels. And we were also able to um, put in a plug-in, so to speak, under the Ask Think Tank channel where members could ask a question or ask for advice to the rest of the think tank uh, completely anonymously. So we've kind of found this to be um, a pretty good way to try to communicate and collaborate online while maintaining some anonymity or creating an environment that felt somewhat secure. When looking for partnerships and, and corporate partners, uh, we were able to find some companies and corporations that also had a vested interest in wellness. Uh, we partnered with US Acute Care Solutions, which is a, an ED staffing organization in the US. We were able to meet with them in person at one of our large meetings in the fall, and they expressed uh, a very big interest in physician wellness, especially since they employ a lot of emergency medicine physicians. They were interested in um, kind of developing with us and uh, learning what they could from us to pass along to the physicians that they employ to keep them well. In addition, we've also partnered with a couple of food delivery organizations where you, know, the, you get the meal prep in the box. Uh, Chef and Peach Dish collaborated with us um, to try to provide some of those options to our resident members. Because as you can imagine, for a busy resident, eating healthy food can be pretty difficult. In terms of the nuts and bolts of the think tank and, and what are the actual solutions we're trying to come up with, uh, we started by partnering with what we call wellness strategists outside of the field of emergency medicine to try to provide an outside perspective um, different than what we were just coming up with ourselves. We partnered with Jason Brooks, who is a performance psychologist out of Canada, and he's worked with us as a group and with individual members on really you know, using performance psychology to combat stress. We've also worked with ZDog MD, who you um, may or may not know, but is considered to be kind of a thought leader uh, in a sense that he's trying to work towards uh, disruption and um, revolution, revolutionizing um, medicine as it's delivered as a system currently. And then we've also been able to work with James Dahl from the White Coat Investor to focus on fiscal responsibility and financial wellness, which is also important for physicians, something that we're not always the best at. In addition to that group and some others that weren't on that screen, such as Shahina, we've worked closely with her. We've also partnered with a group of experts in psychology and psychiatry, as we felt it was important to utilize our colleagues um, from that side of things to talk about mental health and how it impacts residents, to talk about issues such as substance abuse, to talk about how as residents can you increase empathy day to day um, we felt like it was important for them to kind of bring in their perspective as experts from that field and as providers who uh, treat you know, med students and residents and uh, junior faculty. From here, we kind of want to ask a question to you guys. A, do you think that it's a good idea to bring in experts outside of your field of practice to lend an opinion outside of that area? And B, is there an organization or is there a group out there that really seems to be getting wellness right that we could learn from? Not necessarily even in the medical realm. So a couple questions for you guys. I would say it's really important to bring people from the outside in. I think of IDEO, for example, and the teams that they create and bringing people, like, taking an interdisciplinary approach because we're trained in different ways, we are educated in different ways, so um, I think 
adding another perspective or another layer to the opportunity or the problem is really important. Um, and I think in the long run, you end up with a product or a result that is more holistic and can be applied to other professions as opposed to just one. Hi. There we go, yes? Okay, good. Um, so I work uh, with a group called um, the Functional Medicine Coaching Academy, and we train health coaches. And an area we're interested in moving into is supporting uh, residents in particular, but um, young uh, medical providers. Uh, and so the health coaching concept is one that we know can be effective for people because it's a frequent touch. It's kind of a frequent light touch. We can uh, look at sort of a holistic health um, so that we will be talking about, are you eating? Are you sleeping? Are you exercising? Do you have anybody you can talk to? And then we can help, you know, brainstorm if they need um, more in-depth support. So that's one system that um, we're feeling might be able to op offer opportunities. Um, and an organization like ours, everything is online. So the providers don't have to go somewhere to meet with their coach. They just get on their laptop. They have a webcam. They, the hours are flexible. Uh, we have coaches all around the world that we're training now um, in a student uh, coaching center. So um, we have inexpensive coaching available um, for residents who don't have a lot of money um, as a first step. And then if they connect, they can certainly work with one of our alumni after that. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out as a model that is very flexible to a resident's schedule and um, to their pocketbook as well, as a, but a, a way of getting some ongoing support. Great. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my input is that I think it's important to have some uh, like a collaboration, somebody who knows and understands what their daily routine is like and get somebody from outside just to get a fresh perspective or for them to be able to safely in the sense without being judged, they should be able to express themselves because I'm an ophthalmologist and ophthalmology is not where you expect burnout, but even on your uh, data that you showed, but it exists. I just think it's not reported. Just last week, we came across a very a huge problem that we are dealing with in our area, and it is heartbreaking. And I also think that providing them with a life skill to main to deal with stress. That's one. And number two, start early in medical school. We need to change our own culture on how the educators are treating the students. That is, I, I'm very passionate about it, and I will, I'm really applaud all of you bringing this discussion to this conference. Thank you. Well, thank thank you. you. Let's move on to talking about um, what we've come up with, and then we'll take the remainder questions. So in terms of deliverables and what have we kind of done so far, in collaboration with our strategists, we have been able to record a number of podcasts, which are available on the Alium SoundCloud. Um, that way, what we do has been made not only available to the members, but outside of the membership of the think tank. Probably the biggest project that we're working on and what we've been doing has been pre-work for a resident wellness consensus summit that is being co-sponsored with Essentials of Emergency Medicine, a conference taking place this upcoming May. Uh, this is going to be a, a pre-day consensus summit or consensus conference um, that I really feel and we feel is very unique because it's really the only consensus meeting that's going to be focusing on residents as the stakeholder and as those coming up with kind of the consensus recommendations. From here, these are the where we're really focusing on some of our deliverable projects. There are many emergency medicine residency programs that do not have a wellness curriculum. So we have a team that's coming up with a blueprint that they can take back to the program to use and then modify um, to fit their program's needs. Uh, in addition, we're going to be looking at some data as a current survey in emergency medicine residency programs and what the level of burnout currently is. 
um, and there's going to be a group looking at uh, current technology focusing in wellness. This is just a little sample from kind of one of our massive spreadsheets where uh, the residents are testing out different apps and such related to all kinds of health related and uh, wellness related apps. In addition to some of these apps, we're also looking at and evaluating online resources for um, like obtaining therapy and that kind of thing for those that are feel like there's too much of a stigma in their community to go to their local mental health providers. So it's a fairly comprehensive list of, of tech and programs um, that we can give to residents to pick and choose things they can incorporate into their uh, personal daily life. Uh, again, we really feel like this is going to be a great opportunity for the residents. In addition, a, a problem that frequently comes up with a consensus conference is actual representation to come up with a consensus between the uh, enrolled participants in the think tank and also the people who will be attending live, we feel like we've gotten a pretty good representation of residents again across the US, Canada, and there will be some international residents attending. So the virtual community has been a really great vehicle to get mass representation to do the pre-work for this consensus summit. So, you know, we haven't necessarily come up with the solution per se to wellness and this is going to be an ongoing problem for I think a while. A lot of you brought up some great points. We definitely need a culture change. We need to decrease the stigma surrounding talking about mental health issues. Um, we need to not penalize our colleagues for seeking help if they need it. Um, but this is kind of what we came up as a solution and a place we wanted to start. So we really thank you guys for uh, taking the time to listen to us today. And we have a couple minutes left, so we'd be happy to take any questions if anybody has any additional questions. This is a fabulous session. I commend you all for the honesty that you've uh, given us today about your experiences in dealing with it and also how to better improve the situation. Um, just two questions I've got for you. Um, number one, uh, many of us who are faculty who want to try and help, uh, when a problem is recognized, we can try and at least sit residents or trainees down, but I think part of the problem is we're limited because we don't have the experience in how to deal with it. And the resources that we have in terms of counseling aren't available, uh, even at places that might be similar to this. Um, if resources are limited, are there any other suggestions that you have when you're dealing with someone who has a stressful life as a resident or a fellow that you can provide. And secondly, um, I'm trying to be careful how to phrase this. Um, when you have male trainees, the way in which they handle stress may be different than if you're dealing with female trainees. And there's no um, male representative on the sofa right now. I'm, I'm quite, um, I'm, not, I'm not surprised to see that. Um, do you guys have any um, insight about how male residents and trainees and also how male faculty deal with stressful situations for trainees that are men and women, respectively? I hope that question makes sense. I think, Arlene, you want to tackle this? Um, I can, so I can tackle the first question. One of the benefits that I think we saw in creating a virtual community was exactly sort of the problem that you mentioned, where there are pockets in the country where there may be no local resources available. So we felt that the one strength of having something that's utilizing all the technology that we have available is that you could potentially, as a resident, reach out to another resident who lives across the country. Um, and who, who else is there that is better equipped to understand the struggles of a resident than another resident, which is primarily why both the constituents and the stakeholders of the think tank are the same. So we've really hoped um, that they've taken sort of um, bonding with each other and meeting people from across the country to really merge their interests. I mean, as far as you know, the, the individual resident, you know, the person that we're really, this is like, this is the person that we're doing all of this for. Um, that's a hard question to answer, and you know I do a lot. I mean, I, I work a lot in in the wellness sphere, and I, I really hate to say it, but I don't know that we've come up with a fantastic solution yet. I, I really think it lies in culture change, and I think the broad-based effort, like the think tank, is a really big step in the right direction of culture change. 
And regarding your second question, I'll turn it over to Nicole for a second to talk about our distribution. But our leadership actually does include a few other men um, on the field. And I think this also speaks to a culture shift as well. Mm -hmm. And one of our biggest advocates and the reason why this group was put together was um, Dr. Chris Doty, who's the program director at University of Kentucky. Their program, unfortunately, uh, suffered a tremendous loss about a year ago. So I don't have any specific advice um, to address males versus females when they're coming to you with an issue or problem. Um, my v ad initial advice, I guess, would be to try to find a person to reach out to them that you feel like would resonate with them. Um, but we've got other males on the faculty and the resident leadership, and a pro you know, half of at least the half of the strategists that we've worked with have been male as well. Um, so there's definitely interest there, um, but I, I don't know I don't know what the right answer is in terms of trying to address. But I, I agree there's probably some differences. My initial thought would be just to find the person to work with the resident initially that you feel like would resonate best. And then in terms of your first question, there are a lot of resource poor kind of areas. And even if you work at an academic institution, your mental health resources for residents may not be great. Uh, most organizations should have an employee assistance program, but some people don't want to use that in, in fear that they'll be stigmatized. So there really are a lot of online resources. You can do virtual um, therapy with people uh, online and they're all licensed therapists, but these aren't really resources that a lot of people are familiar with. So part of what we're hoping to do is just make people aware of the resources that they can use if they feel like they're in a pinch or they just don't want to use the resources that they have available due to concerns they have. So before I turn it over to Shahina for our final thoughts, we'll take one more question. Uh, this is just a comment to dovetail off of what the information you just provided, just that there's a pretty robust literature on male patterns of depression and female patterns of depression, and maybe some flags are more obvious to us than others. But the way at least emergency medicine works in the U.S. with the Council of Residency Directors, the majority of program directors are uh, men. And so, uh, and the trainees now, I think we're at the point of 50-50 in terms of uh, medical students going into emergency medicine, the distribution of men and women. So there is attention paid to it for sure, and a knowledge that signs and symptoms may present differently. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to turn over to Shahina for one last thought. So in closing, the time is now. We recognize and understand more about physician wellness and unwellness than we ever have before. The question is, what do we do about it? Well, we can continue to do little and to allow the status quo, or we can make the decision that not just as a profession, but as a community, we're going to grasp this with both hands and we're going to determine to fix it, firstly by empowering our residents. Finding the solution, I feel, will require intellect, but more than that, it will require heart. The end game here is to normalize the conversation on wellness so effectively that if a junior doctor is noted to be struggling, anyone from a hospital executive to a medical colleague to a nursing, allied health, even non-clinical staff member, perhaps even with some careful thought, a patient might feel comfortable enough to reach out a hand and ask, doctor, are you okay? Thank you very, very much. Thank you.